box. So we are about to start our session for today right now. And let's feel free to drop our comments in the chat box. It's going to be as interactive as possible. It's different from any learning session or series you've actually attended before. I'm telling you for a fact. So as we get started, I would just like to introduce you to Susty Vibes. Um, and Susty Vibes is actually a youth-led organization. We are led by youth and uh, we have different projects and activities where we make sustainability actionable and relatable for people in Nigeria and Africa as a continent. And you'll see, I was happy to see a diverse community for, of people on this learning session today. And different projects that we run at Sustainable Vibes are focused on education for sustainable development, ecofeminism, community building, advocacy, secularity, and finally, which we are why we are here today, climate and mental health. And this is this focal area is actually um done through one of our is done through one of our projects called the Enco Anxiety Project. And that is why we are all here today to discuss this as a matter of urgency. Next slide, please. So this, like I told us earlier, I said all of our projects, you know, are focused on all the things I've listed earlier. And a core thing why we are here is to discuss about climate and mental health, which is done through our flash, our flagship project called the Enco Anxiety Project. So Anchor is a sub-project on under the Enco Anxiety Project called T. And what is Anchor set to do? Anchor is a collaborative work between Susty Vibes and Tecla. And through this Anchor learning series, which we are going to do for six months, like once in a month, yeah, we are bringing together mental health professionals. We are bringing together health practitioners. You know, we are bringing all them together in this learning series to learn about the connection between climate change and our mental health so that when they have the rightful information, the rightful knowledge, you know, they were able to lead in conversations on how to support people who are impacted by people and communities are impacted by the climate crisis, which is a global threat to our, our lives and our health. Next slide, please. So I will call on one of our partners to actually come up and talk to us about this. Thank you very much, Opeemi. Uh, my name is Dorothy. I work with MDOC Healthcare and we are partnering with Sassy Vibes to deliver these early education sessions uh, to build the capacity of health workers across uh, the areas of mental health and then climate change. So TECLA is an acronym that uh, stands for Tele-Education for Clinicians and Leaders in Africa, um, health workers, nurses, doctors, administrators, medical superintendents in health um, sectors. TECLA is directed towards all of them. And TECLA is um, a program that was um, initiated by Making More Health. And uh, Making More Health is an initiative by Boringa Inglaheim and then Ashoka. Um, that seeks to build the capacity of health workers across Africa. TECLA leverages the University of New Mexico's ECHO model to deliver training and capacity building opportunities for healthcare workers, uh, mid-level managers and leaders in Africa, as I've already mentioned. And we have already kicked off a pilot in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Ghana, and we are looking to expand across other African countries to provide training sessions for healthcare workers. And uh, with uh, TECLA, we seek to improve knowledge gained by healthcare workers and then the mid-level managers, as I've already mentioned. And uh, uh, this is uh, usually done so that we can tell uh, the amount of information and information that is being collected by healthcare workers on uh, these tele-education sessions that we have, uh, which will indirectly impact the lives of our patients and then our members, our clients that we attend to from time to time. So in all, we are contributing to providing the quality of care 
uh, by healthcare providers across all of Africa. Thank you very much. Over to you, Opeiri. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for that brief overview of Thecla. We are so happy to listen to that. Um, next slide. As we move on, yes, I want um every one of us here today to note that we'll be collecting um our registration information, our questions and answers. And please let's uh let's note that all these details that we are collecting, they are going to be strictly kept confidential. And basically, they are going to be used for impact measuring and also to inform new initiatives. Thank you. So the next slide, please. So why is Anchor that we've brought to you today different from every other learning series that you might have attended before? Now, Anchor was actually, um, the curriculum of Anchor was formed and developed based on participants' needs. You know, we, we reach out to our participants, our prospective participants, in order to develop a curriculum that's tailored to their needs so that they can be able to understand the connection between climate change and mental health and be able to apply knowledge for the successful and smooth running of their um, profession. So this is a capacity building program mm -hmm. that the curriculum was developed based on participants' needs. And the second one is that in this learning session, we're going to be bringing to you real life experiences or cases or case studies, you know, of people who had actually been um, impacted with climate change mentally so that we all can interactively engage and see that these things are real life issues and they are and climate change is sincerely a global threat to our lives and health. And the last thing also is that ANCOR is led by African subject matter experts. Our trainers are seasoned in this field and they are leading voices and contributors to conversations bordering on climate change and mental health. And they are coming with their years of experience to pour into us and build our capacity for progressive work in our different spheres of influence. Next slide, please. So let's note that our Zoom session will be recorded. I'm sure you've actually heard the notification earlier on. And like I said, it's, it's basically for impact measurement. Thank you. Next slide, please. And also, um, these are the tips that will help us, you know, to be able to participate effectively in the session. Let's try to raise up our hands when we want to talk. Let's make use of the chat box as often as possible. Please, when we have comments we want to raise, let's drop them in the chat box. And all our comments, let's try to make them as respectful as possible. Every word opinion is actually valid. And if we have any issues, any technical issues, please let's reach out to the contact on the screen. And our team member will be ready to respond to you as soon as possible. Let's move to the next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today, and this is how we're going to be going on with our program. Next slide, please. Over to you, Ayo. It's so, once again, so nice to have everyone here. We're happy to have you. And please sit back and enjoy the learning session. Please don't forget to come in with your pen and book because there are so much learning to actually pick up from this session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Ope, for that wonderful introduction. Um, like Ope said, we are so happy to have every one of you here. My name is Ayomide Olude, and I am the project manager in charge of the Echo Anxiety Africa project, which um, is housing anchor learning projects as a sub project. Uh, today, I'll just be taking us on a pre-quiz before we introduce our speaker and go directly into the training session. would like to um, understand your knowledge because we know this is a new topic anyways, and if we are all learning as a go, uh, we'd like to understand the level of knowledge and um, would go ahead to share a pre-quiz. You'll see um, the, the pop-up on your screen. So you can just interact with that pop-up by answering um, 
seven questions. We have seven questions for you to answer. Uh, so I hope you can see the pop-up. If you can see the pop-up, kindly react in the comment session or yeah. I haven't seen any reaction. Can we all see the pop-up? Okay, thank you Obi, for answering that. Thank you, Adora. So I um, would like for you to answer these questions and interact. They are very interactive. Just click on the answer that you think um, it is appropriate for these questions. Um, there is no wrong or right answer. Uh, we just want to use it to measure knowledge to improve on our learning sessions for every one of us here. Yeah, I can see some answers coming in. More answers, please. I can only see about 6% um, of everybody has responded. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just, you know, um, gauging our knowledge, you know, trying to improve our session. And it's also for you as a participant, you know, to know where you are at currently and where you will be after the session. So I would like to see more people um, interacting with this poll. If you have any issue interacting with the poll, kindly signify in the chat and our technical assistants will reach to you. So there are no penalties, rather they are right or wrong answers, but there are no penalties um, for this whole question. Apologies, but it's just to say um, we are we are all learning. You know, it's right. It's 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 normal for you not to know something. That is why you are joining this learning session to build on that knowledge. Yeah. So no penalties. I encourage as many of you to also keep joining. Yeah. Thank you. Kindly keep your answers coming. At the end of at the end of um, our session for today, we'll know the right answers to this. So you can also build up on that knowledge. You can take notes to note um, your answers at this time. During our post quiz, we'll also review the answers to these questions. Okay, um, great. I'll be ending the poll now to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much for participating in this poll. We'll get our answer at the end of the session. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, yeah, so like I said earlier, we have two amazing speakers with us today. Um, they are learned professionals, really good at their work, and they've been, you know, they've dedicated their life to understanding the intersections of climate change and mental health, which you'll be learning from them today. It is really a privilege to have them with us today. And, you know, I, know, I definitely know you would enjoy the session. Our first speaker for today um, is Jennifer Uchendu, and she's the founder of Sosti Vibes. Um, if you are just joining, like I said, Sosti Vibes is leading this project um, with our core partners, as you can see their logos on the screen. So I'll go ahead to read Jennifer's bio and introduce our next speaker. So Jennifer Uchendu is a climate activist. She's a sustainability analyst and the founder of Sosti Vibes, a youth-led organization making sustainability relatable and actionable for young people in Nigeria. Jennifer's interests lie in the intersection of women, 
youth, the environment, and recently she launched the Equanxiety Africa project focused on exploring and understanding the experience of equanxiety in African populations through research and advocacy. Jennifer started Susty Vibes as an educational blog for sustainability and environmental advocacy, you know, targeted at educating young Nigerians. The success of Susty Vibes as a blog showed that, you know, translating the word of sustainability through pop culture makes messages more relatable and impactful on young people. With time, the team started to think of how to use the power of volunteerism to bring together young people who want to make sustainability actionable. The blog has since evolved for many sustainability research and design led by young people. Susty Vibes now connects with youth and numerous motivated volunteers using preferred mediums, be it dance, music, art, or community events. Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Covenant University and a master's degree in development studies specialized in climate change and gender at the Institute of Development Studies, England. She is a 2019 Shevening Scholar, a 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow, and the co-author of an of the ebook a guide to business sustainability in nigeria welcome jennifer we are so honored to have you with us today next slide please our next speaker is professor kenneth yongabi achan um, and he is a distinguished professor in public health and infectology with over 150 scientific publications, more than 120 conference papers and proceedings, three books, plus a breadth of experience that covers workshops as well as consultancies, including WHO, HPD, Federal Ministry of Health, African Union Scientific Research and Innovation Council, Danida DFDI research covers the African public health systems where he has demonstrated through pilot projects the public health realities required for Africa and Afrocentric health literacy demonstration projects rooted in indigenous knowledge in combating climate change related mental grief. In contribution, in contribution, um, climate change related environmental grief. In 2020, he received the Mark Poplet Gold Medal for distinguished research contributions in Africa from the Cameroon Academy of Sciences and an honorary recognition by the Minister of State for Health, Nigeria, in 2022 for the significant contributions in phytomedicines in Nigeria. Um, he is a professor at Imo State University and Claritian University of Nigeria. He is a fellow of the Public Health Practitioner Councils of Nigeria and is currently coordinating the Sub-Saharan Africa's Regional Dialogue on Climate Change Impacts on Mental Health in collaboration with Imperial College and supported by the Wellcome Trust. Um, you can see that our speakers are well packed and well experienced in this field. Um, I would like to welcome Professor Yongabi to take the stage and lead us on his training session first. Note to our speakers, we have you have 20 minutes each, and when it's five minutes to the end of your session, I'm going to give you a prompt because I know this discussion is going to be interesting. Uh, so welcome, Professor Kenneth. Um, you have the floor. Professor Kenneth, you can unmute yourself, please. All right, thanks. I was just waiting for the rights to be given to me. Thank you very much. May I thank uh, the organizers, Sosti Vibe, 
for um, uh, inviting me for this very important uh, training uh, workshop on climate change and mental health, looking at a broad view across Africa. So I really would thank all of you. And I also would uh, thank, would like to thank the participants who are here today, uh, you know, who availed the time to be here today. Uh, without much ado, because of time, I would just like to go through my uh, slides, if you can roll them, you know, from your end. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, uh, we are in, we really, right now, the world is at crossroads with uh, climate change. And um, it's, it's no longer news. Uh, it's no longer a hoax that, um, you know, climate is affecting all of us and that we need to come to congregate together uh, to understand uh, this climate change. More than ever before, the climate is now um, changing uh, at a very unprecedented rate at the moment. So my talk will really uh, narrow down to, this is the thematic areas that will, that has captured, that's going to capture my talk, uh, climate change, synoptics, mental health crisis in Africa. How do we really unpack the connections uh, between climate and mental health? How do we build mental health adaptability and resilience? Uh, what are the local strategies that we can actually use to mitigate uh, this climate change and mental health? Just move to the next slide. Next slide. So what is climate? We all can define climate. So there's no need for me to talk about uh, climate, but I want to give you an exercise. Um, how do you define climate in Yoruba language? How do you define climate in Igbo language? What is climate? in Hausa and Kulani language. What is climate in Swahili? That's assignment. I don't want us to define it from a colonial language. Thank you. Move to the next slide. Next slide. Again, um, yes, when you start defining climate and mental health from colonial language, you will miss, you will adulterate it. I want you to come sui generis, up in issue to say mental health. At the end of this lecture, I want everybody to shout mental health in the different languages across Nigeria. Then you will be able to understand. That is the beginning of the deontological understanding of climate and mental health first. Now, 50% of this world right now, um, most of the countries uh, in the world are experiencing greenhouse gas emission, but Africa is contributing less. That's the irony, paradoxically. The impact is felt heavy in Africa, paradoxically. Next slide, please. Next slide. Climate change vulnerability in Africa. Yes, we are vulnerable, but there are some more areas. There are some, because of geographical location, we'll be more vulnerable. Some certain areas are more vulnerable than others. We've just highlighted that on the map. Then also, because of poverty, because of conflicts, and civil unrest in certain areas, those areas will become more vulnerable to climate change impact and even the mental health. Next slide. So a lot to talk about this. So let's move on to the next slide. I'll pitch one example, one example to show you the impact. Let's take Lake Chad. If you look at on your left, you see 1963, Lake Chad was full. The water levels full. Look at it, 1973. The blue areas, they are receding, becoming smaller. Look at it, 1987. Look at it again, 1997. 2007, would you want me to now bring satellite pictures of uh, Lake Chad in 2023? You begin to weep. That's just very evidential. Very evidential that climate is impacting all of us. Now, what is the mental health of the people who have lived through this Lake Chad changes? When they were able to fish, they were able to move around there, they were able to have algae. Lake Chad is rich in spirulina platensis, microalgae. They can no longer get the microalgae now. The fish diversity, they're not able to get it because of the fact that the water levels are very, very low at the moment. What has happened? There are certainly anthropogenic factors that has actually, you know, uh, impacted negatively. And how do these people now feel when they are not able to fish? They are not able to get what they need to get, the economic activities, the agro-industrial activities that were taking place at micro scale by the indigents. The chart is shared by Nigeria, Chad, and Cameroon. Next slide. 
Next slide. What are the prevalent, you know, uh, climate change havocs in Africa? In public health, we use the word incidence and we use the word prevalence. What is the difference, generic difference between prevalence and incidence? Prevalence is total number. Incidence is what? Incidence is, uh, you know, sporadic occurrence. So in climate change, what are the prevalent climate change or devastations across Africa? We have drought. You can see that. Next slide. We have drought, wildfires, floods, and landslides. I would say that floods and landslides are the most prevalent. Look at across Africa, Mali, Nigeria, Cameroon, Mozambique, uh, South Africa. Floods are really ravaging havocs. So these are the prevalent. If you compare it to wildfires, if you compare it to droughts, if you compare it to cyclone idols and different cyclones that are available, you will now agree that the public health analysis will focus on the fact that floods and landslides and mudslides are most prevalent climate devastation. It's not like they never occurred in the past. They have been occurring in the past, but now look at the, the devastation, the intensity and the gravity tells you that something is provoking it. Next slide. Next slide. Storm and extreme temperatures. Yeah, we have storm and extreme temperatures. These are also, you know, quite, you know, uh, widespread across Africa, but not as prevalent as you would have landslides and mudslides. Now, in the past, several years ago, when there were storm and extreme temperatures, Africans thought the gods were wild. And if you read the book called Murder in the Cathedral, they will tell you, uh, written by a Nigerian, you know, poet, they will tell you that uh, the gods are to be blamed. That's what the Africans will think when they think about heavy storm and extreme temperatures, lightning, thunderstorms. They attribute that to the gods. That's the African perception. That is the anthroposophy of Africa. So there are so many things about that really can come around here. Next slide. And we have to consider all this when we're talking about climate change and mental health. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Projected change in number of hot days. So these are satellite uh, pictures, modern pictures telling you that more is coming in the future. That by 2030, honestly, I hope we're all alive. We're not, but we don't want those who will be alive to experience this calamity. That the hot, the more that there will be hotter days as we move ahead. Next slide. Next slide. That projection is just giving you, for instance, just hotter days. What about floods? 2030, what would we anticipate floods to be like? Maybe storms. I mean, I mean, we can just imagine. Sometimes even just imagining what our grandchildren or children will begin to encounter at, in 2030. You know, already we in the living begin to have mental health challenges. Anxiety comes in. This is okay, equal anxiety. So what is mental health? So I've asked you and all of us to go and define mental health in our language. No, this is not language. Take, next slide, please. Next slide. So what's the connection between climate change and mental health? As a public health expert, I would begin to tell you that the connection is there, but the connection, uh, the, the manifestation has been very pretty much asymptomatic, unlike other diseases where the symptoms are staring clearly. You have a malaria, for instance, you start having, you know, pyrexia or, what, you know, pyresis, with high temperatures, a headache, you know, and all that. But when you have when you have emotions, anxiety, and all that, how do they express themselves? So most of it is lying down, quiescent, asymptomatic. So that's why we need to unravel the connection between climate change and mental health. Critical at this moment. Next slide. Next slide. So to me, to unravel this, we need to look at who we are in Africa. We cannot. We don't have the same magnitude of mental uh, behaviors like the Europeans, like other uh, continents. Africans are people who have undergone grief, who live with grief, who live in despair, who live in sadness. You look at so many you know, confounding factors, sociopolitical, this, this socioeconomic determinants are so staring on the face of all Africans. We go through havocs. So already we have pre-existential mental health issues. Anxiety is there. Emotions are there. But the question is, how do we attribute this particular uh, emotions 
anxiety, grief, depression as a result of climate change. That is the million dollar assignment that we have to be able to unravel this, which is a big challenge. But the question is, we need to obviously have a metrics to be able to measure this. There are traditional challenges to so cultural expectations that are on us, the burden is heavy. So we're living on that. So normally if you want to take a scale, the mental health challenges, the mental health uh, measurement of we Africans particularly would be uh, much higher than those of the Europeans or those of the West, basically, if you want to subtract all these challenges because we are already existing with these challenges, which are not the same challenges in Europe. So we did a study here and we looked at mental health among flood communities in Nigeria. We took some you know, cases in the um, uh, South South. I will mention some of these communities here for confidentiality reasons. And then we were looking at IDPs, internally displaced people due to uh, floods. And we looked at their, hyper, their blood pressure. And there's a lot to, found, to we found out from here that their blood pressures got risen to uh, disproportional levels. And uh, even when they are taking medication, the blood pressure were not dropping for, uh, on the average that we were able to find out. So we did a clinical mental uh, health study as a result of the impact of uh, climate change. And we realized that they were suffering from what they call echoarrhythmia. <laughs> echoarrhythmia is a new term that we came we're publishing that paper right now, you know, where we have unnecessary heartbeats, fear caused by anxiety, caused by emotions, caused by bipolar disorders and all that stuff. Next slide, please. Next slide. And we also observed that, you know, we did that and found out there's no significant difference between these, uh, between females and males uh, living in internally displaced communities. And then we did a retrospective study to find out that when they were coming back as they were in, from their homes, their BPs were pretty much stable compared to when they are living in internally displaced communities. This is very exciting. And even when they are taking uh, anti-BP uh, uh, medications like uh, beta blockers, you know, nifedipine, allopurinol, and all that, uh, their BPs were not dropping significantly because they were worried. It's all built in their mind that, oh, how am I going to cope from here? So as a result of that medication, clinical medications that were therapeutic that were being given to them, they had no significant uh, response as per when they were living on this unstabilized, you know, uh, or stabilized in their uh, pre previous uh, communities. Next slide, please. And we also observed this in another community in Cameroon. So we did this study, both in Nigeria and Cameroon, and realized that the same, you know, the same results are similar. So, so how do we assess the effects of climate change? People having malaria and being displaced by floods, how you do you expect taking artemisinin or lomifantrin or amatem gel? How do you expect that they will respond? These are challenges. These are all clinical challenges. These are all interconnected. And these are the kind of things that we are doing in our studies. Um, so to be able to do this, you need to undertake an individual mental history. You need to undertake community mental history. And that's what we are doing in some of our studies. We have some detailed data on this. History taking of mental anthropogenic data is very, very important. Now, behavioral patterns before, during, and after the disaster, something we are doing. We have a paper, book chapter we are publishing on this. Next slide, please. So this baseline uh, health data in order to come up with climate risk areas is key in order for us to you know, prepare early warning system in, in anticipation of living healthy. So we were also looking at, and I'm so recommending this because this is a new field and a lot of research has been done in this area, existential anxiety in the family history. If you want to know whether this climate change is really affecting these people, you need to also look at the existential history to know how they have been behaving based on that history before you can attribute that change to climate change, that, uh, that anxiety to climate change, before you can use the word eco-anxiety. Other existential mental health problems, for example, poverty uh, related to mental health crisis, derived emotions, or what they call poverty derived emotions, poverty derived grief, poverty derived stress, poverty derived tantrums. So other social disasters, very important to be able to see how we can put them pari passu and come up clearly that this is caused by mental health. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, putting strings together. What kind of strings we're going to put together? Very key. Climate change and mental health is a string. We need to attach, put these strings together. We need to be able to identify the climate disasters, which we have just talked about. 
We need to check if the disaster is frequently occurring because there are some disasters that have been occurring in the past and they were taboos. You know, you find people in Africa, they tell you they can create rain. People in Africa tell you they can, you know, precipitate rain or they can actually, you know, cause dryness in order for occasion to come in. So all these kinds of things, are they true? Are this, I mean, what is the empiricism of this? Can we verify? So how do we, how has the occurrence changed over time? That is climate change. Well, we're able to measure that. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I brought this inter, something we, you know, you can, we can read all about the interconnection between nature and health. We cannot really talk about mental health effects due to climate change without looking at it in the systemic or systems approach because a lot of them are indirect. For example, when floods, you know, uh, destroy farm, farm lands, it is, you are becoming emotional. You are becoming, you know, you are in despair. You are being depressed because of the fact that your crops have been destroyed. But if we have climate devastation, as if we had heavy rains and heavy floods without destruction, would you be mentally moved? It's a question. If you have heavy rains, floods all over, over, even floods like the days of Noah and no destruction, would you have depression? Depression comes as a result of a destruction, something you, that is directly affecting you. So the mental health measurement is an indirect, uh, uh, you know, assay, I pull it that way. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So prevalent disasters in Africa. So we have done this. We've done what they call a scoping review. Uh, we have a paper on that. You know, uh, from Cameroon, Nigeria, South Africa, Malawi, uh, Mozambique, Chad, uh, Niger. We have extreme droughts in parts of Nigeria, in Chad, Central African Republic, Ethiopia, particularly areas in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and South Sudan. And Sudan, these are areas that are now really experiencing extreme drought as a result of climate change. So we did pre uh, dialogue scoping for 54 member state countries, and we are seeing some very interesting data arising from that. And then we also looked at how this affect social, physical, and mental. We cannot, we have to be very careful. For all of us climate scientists and all climate advocates, we have to be very careful. We have to start looking at it from a systemic point of view, not to isolate it. We have to look at it physically, socially, and mentally. All, they all interconnect. So the fear is if we're looking at, looking at it from a linear parameter, we may run the risk of, uh, you know, uh, some certain confounding uh, challenges or confounding data arising tomorrow. We have to be very careful. So we actually, Catalyze, I mean, uh, catalog this eco anxiety. Yes, it's very common. Eco depression, bipolar disorders. And then we came up with eco mortality. So we have case of eco mortality and how we calculate that using uh, public health parameters. There's uh, it's something we can do training on. Uh, you know, you have also what we call uh, this uh, mere uh, panic, the kind of, you know, sudden panic disorders, alcohol abuse, contemplation of alcohol abuse frustration, anger, social phobia, and all climate, um, mental health disaster. And one very intriguing one we observe is from the Pygmies of Congo, within, you know, South Cameroon, Southwest, I mean, the Southern uh, part of Cameroon, and then also in Democratic Republic of Congo, where they're living on tree tops, climate change is affecting them, and it's affecting their mental health because some of the trees are becoming extinct, and these are trees that were, that are considered at home. And even if you give them a three-story building, they will not like to stay in a three-story building, they just want to stay on tree tops. That is their tradition. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, this is the prompt for five minutes um, left for your session. Yeah. Beautiful. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide. Can you roll to the next slide quickly? So these are the effects. Look at the man there looking so depressed, stressed, because floods have destroyed his crop. So, you can imagine, you can measure the core mental morbidity. Look at the car killed there. Look at the way people are looking sad. You know, that trepidation. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So the mortality is all uh, captured here, but this data is becoming uh, obsolete right now. Next slide. Next slide. So climate mental health resilience building in Africa, what strategies do we need? So we need data. We need to generate data. We need to generate knowledge. We're indigenous knowledge. Uh, and next slide, just move on to the next slide. And where do we really go from here? Knowledge, 
data, information, and decision. Next slide. Very, very key. Next slide. So African indigenous knowledge is very important for us. There are taboos, there are perceptions that we have in our, in our tradition about climate. And that's why I asked you, if it's only when you learn how to define it from your, from your uh, dialect, and that's when you begin to understand climate change. If you are defining it, if you are defining climate change from English to Yoruba or from English to Igbo, <laughs> you are making an existential calamity error. So we have to know that. Take care. Move to the next one. Next slide. So I can wrap up. So knowledge and perception, very important. Uh, you know, with these studies here to find out people think climate change is, uh, you know, is shaking of the gods and all that. And, uh, so many, you know, uh, taboos and so many perceptions arising from that. We need to be able to take care of that. If we don't catalog that, we cannot build resilience. Next slide. Next slide. Just go on to the next slide. So we need, uh, that's why we need Afrocentric research. The kind of research that has to build on ethnography, cultural, characteristic, traditional councils, and sexual beliefs, and all that. So, next slide. And this information is very important in building our questionnaire. Next slide, please. And we need a training on how to construct questionnaire for collecting such information. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So, very important. Move to the next slide. So, all the behavioral pattern between short, medium, and long term, we need to be able to catalog them. Some of these. Uh, mental health crisis are things that we need to be able to dissociate them from epilepsy, dissociate them from certain, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, information, cultural information or taboos that come in where people think they're bewitched and they move around with psychiatric problems. How do we be able to dissociate this from climate change and all that? So we can give you details on that. We need serious training. The assignment is too detailed for us if we want to implement strategies and policies. Next slide. Next slide. So that I can wrap up. And in conclusion, just move to the conclusion there. Uh, so this is, uh, you can read this. Climate change threatens us, we all know, but we need clear research methodologies for this. Uh, move to the next slide. We need clear research methodologies. At the moment, the research methodologies are flawed right now. We need information technology uh, for us to be able to build databases for that. Next slide. You can just roll the slides so uh, the audience can see so that. Uh, and then uh, on, on a final note for me to wrap up here, the assignment is huge. Um, I would like to say this. Uh, in our work, we've built, um, because of the fact that there are direct and indirect consequences of climate change onto our health, our mental health, we've been able to build green technologies uh, for farming systems. We are using the traditional African farming system so that in case there is so much flood, you can build what they call backyard farming integrated system, where with a small piece of land, you're able to have multiplicity of crops growing and production yield heavy. You can get us to us on that. We've built a project called the Green Manure, where certain plants that we have identified, they provoke and produce nitrogen and phosphorus. Clearly, you just put them in the soil and they're able to provoke uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and you don't need big lands for that. We built a system where we are using a lot of waste and producing biogas using plastic system, just a small plastic, which costs you only about uh, maybe uh, 20,000 uh, Naira, and you can be able to produce biofertilizer. So we need this integrated farming system. And then we've also have, uh, once our people who are affected by climate are able to produce their crops, you, are, you, you will discover that you're building community resilience. You're actually taking cushioning, their mental health and all that. We build systems, we have ecological systems that does not use chlorine to treat water, does not use alum to treat water, does not use energy to treat water. That's amazing. So when we Walk, when we talk, we have to walk the talk. And these are the kinds of technology we need in Africa. i like to end here. There's a lot that we need to do. And I thank Susti Vibes and that the assignment is just beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your talk. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, and I would just like to say mental health in Yoruba, where I'm from, is Ilera Opolo. So I have done my assignment and I hope you all are also trying to do yours. Um, so in, in respect of time, I would like to invite our next speaker, Jennifer. Jennifer Uchin, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Aya. And thank you so much, Prof. 
It is always an exciting opportunity learning from you, hearing everything that you have to share about the intersection between climate change and mental health. We are so grateful. Okay, so welcome again, everyone. I'm here in a double capacity as uh, the founder of Susti Vibes and also a researcher who has been doing a lot of work on the intersection between climate change and mental health. And today we would really just be looking at an overview. Can we go to my slides, please? So we'll have an overview, a few of the things um, Prof has already um, talked at. And I think my session will look more about around the mental health side of things, particularly around children and young people. But this is an overview and it's an invitation for you to join all of the series that we have planned for Anchor. Every week we would go deeper looking at this relationship between climate change and mental health. Next slide. So I'd like us to start with this um, sort of African um, perspective or quotes, looking at um, what, do, what are people saying about climate change right now when we go to conferences. And um, Ambassador Josefa says that Africa, like other regions, has come to terms with the reality that climate change is already happening. When I came into this field about seven, eight years ago, we we're still grappling with the idea of is climate change real? Is it an African problem? But we're far from that. We're here now. And if we don't do anything about what's happening, um, Ambassador Josepha says that the coming decades and years will easily be characterized by severe climate-induced pressure, pressure on the continent's economy, livelihoods, and nature. And of course, in, by extension, our health. And Prof has already done a good job of just showing us our vulnerability across different regions of um, the continent. And of course, you know, places like Libya, Nigeria, um, you know, there's flood issues, there's sea level rise happening across the continent, which is directly impacting our health. Next slide. So I won't, I won't dig deeply into what climate change is. We already know, but I think there's a scenario that's happening is the fact that um, even though Africa has not caused a lot of the climate change as it were, we are disproportionately impacted. So there is a justice problem happening. There's the fact that people, young people, farmers, women, children, and generally Africans are having to, you know, suffer the brunt of climate change, even though we did not cause it historically. And we know how we got here, massive fossil fuel exploration, global de development acceleration that did not consider the environment really looking at it. And I would say that given Africa's high exposure, our low cap adaptive capacity, and also our fragility, right? The impacts of climate change are severe. And at the same time, we're having to grapple with other development issues. You agree with me that Africa is still grappling with unemployment, poverty, food insecurity, education. There are lots of issues that are happening on ground now. And climate change in itself, it's a multiplier. It's making all of these issues worse. It's worsening malaria, for example. It's in is introducing even more temperature related diseases. So you see that the impact of climate change is very far reaching, impacting different areas of our life. Next slide. And so where are some of the places that climate change is impacting us? Our health, our well-being, which is why we're here. Also agriculture, people's livelihoods, not just farmers, people's jobs. It's also impacting justice and human rights, conflict and insecurity, biodiversity loss, gender. Um, there have been reports of domestic violence following after climate disasters. There are reports of farmers having to you know, sell their children, their female children off for marriage because they are not able to cope with um, the weather issues that they are facing in their farmlands. And generally, this is impacting young people and future generations. Young people right now are grappling with this crisis of climate change. It's an existential crisis. Young people in many parts of the world, including Africa, are thinking, for example, is there any point to have children and have families if the world is about to get destroyed? So 
this session here is really important. It's showing us not just the relationship between mental health and climate change, but for us to see that we have a ticking time bomb in our hands. This is a public health issue that we need all hands on ground to really, really support us. Next slide. And so, Prof has already done a good job in looking at the different ways climate change impacts our health. Whether we're looking at malnutrition, waterborne infection, very much an African problem, post-flood disasters, storms, injuries and fatalities. I'm sure you all know what happened in October 2022 when we had over 10,000 people displaced from their homes. Uh, malaria, dengue fever, Zika happening in different parts of the world, air pollution and allergen impacting, as causing asthma, increasing the risks of even developmental issues in children. And of course, we have heat waves, heat waves and wildfires um, happening across the continent, um, causing heat stress, making things worse for people who already have issues with mental health uh, problems. And of course, violence, poverty, migration, all of these issues are causing shocks. They're causing trauma. They are stressors that are really impacting people's mental health and they need to be discussed. Very often when we talk about climate change in Africa, we talk about the physical impact. We talk about the financial impact. Very less do we talk about the loss and damage that are very non-economical, about people's mental health and about people's well-being. My point of view with this research has been to say, if Africa really, really wants to be serious about climate adaptation, we want to check our psychological resilience. We want to see if people can cope with the crisis. Can they adapt? Can they be able to think of some of these really interesting and indigenous um, indigenous innovations that Prof has talked about. How are we going to cope as a continent? How are people going to have the positive psychological resilience to actually cope? The onus is on us as mental health professionals, people who are enthusiastic about health in Africa to really pay attention to this issue. Next slide. And so when we zoom down into climate and mental health, I, I need to say that research is still emerging. There's still a whole lot to do. In 2019, when I started to explore this topic, I struggled with the lack of data. There's you know, very few information about what's happening in Africa. And I'm glad that we're doing this now. I'm glad that we're trying to raise awareness, working with people like Prof and Mr. Betwell, who are working across the continent to actually help us get data. So with climate change and mental health, there are three ways that we can look at it. We can look at people who have experience of ext extreme weather events. So people who have been impacted by floods, sea level rise, droughts and related issues. And people who have seen um, experience of their environment changing, right? So you might not have been in contact with a, a flood, but you've seen your environment change. You've seen weather patterns change. For example, that happens a lot with farmers. You've seen that seasons are changing over time, and this is impacting your well-being. It's impact impacting the way you feel about where you live. And I'll speak a bit on that. Um, there's also awareness and exposure to climate change information. Information. And this is the one that is really impacting young people and children a lot now. When you look at the news, you do a Google search on climate change, it's all about doomism. We have less than 10 years to live. You know, um, scientists have found this disaster. You know, this is happening. A lot of there would be no life by 2030. You know, all of this information is coming out, and the media is actually contributing to climate anxiety. Young people are threatened for their future. There are young people who are not able to sleep. Cognitive functions are being impaired. They feel powerless. And, you know, this is something that I, I believe that mental health professionals need to really pay attention to because Africa is a young continent. We have for Nigeria, for example, over 60% of our population are young people under 25. And if climate change is a Nigerian problem, then we really need to look at the intersection between the resilience of the future of the country. And also, Climate change and mental health impact can be direct or indirect. Indirect through you know, worry, climate anxiety. So you haven't experienced the issues, but you're just thinking about them. You're worried about them and it's causing distress. There's also the social tensions, right? So 
farmers, headsmen are clashing in Nigeria, for example, as a result of Greenland's dying um, and, you know, they're struggling with resources. And these are all climate change related issues. Like Chad, for example, as it continues to shrink, there are social tensions that are happening um, in parts of the country. There's also direct impacts. Research is showing us that post-traumatic stress disorder is happening with people who have, you know, for example, experienced flooding or had to be displaced from their home as a result of, you know, a climate change disaster. We've seen suicide in farmers. We've seen depression in young people. We've also seen substance abuse, you know, in people whose livelihood are dependent or weather related impacts. So you can imagine the interlinkages of how this can impact well-being and people's livelihoods. Next slide. And so we'll just go through a few definitions. Um, it's good that when we come out of this class, these are some words that I think we should really know and remember. Um, one of them is solastasia. Um, it was coined um, in the early 90s around look by an environmental psychologist looking at what happens when your environment starts to change around you and you can't do anything about it, right? And it's defined about the homesickness people have when they are still at home, right? So you're living in an area, I was speaking to someone who is about her, in her 60s and she said to me, Ikoyi has changed. This is not the Ikoyi we used to know. We used to have trees. We used to know, you know, we used to know the weather and all. And I fear for young people that you would never experience Ikoyi the way we did. And I thought this was really interesting. This is literally Solastasia playing out in Africa, playing out in Lagos. But unfortunately, we don't always have research to you know, cover all of this. Um, climate anxiety, which is something we've been really working around, is looking around the range of emotions experienced due to direct or indirect exposure to climate change impacts. And I'll speak a bit on, you know, climate anxiety in um, subsequent um, slides. Social tensions, um, whether it's intergenerational, young people saying to older people, why didn't you do enough? You know, why didn't you protest enough? And that blame game we see a lot happening, not just across the world, but even in places like Africa, where young people are, you know, blaming, blaming, blaming their parents, older people for just not taking action around whether it's socioeconomical, socioenvironmental, and political issues that you know they they lived in. We're also seeing civil tensions, you know. For example, a lot of young people that I know, even within Africa, do not trust their government. When we hear about um, a Climate Africa Week, for example, the young people don't feel that their government will prioritize these issues. Um, tensions are also arising across communities. I spoke about the farmers and headsmen. All of these tensions are impacting our well being. So it gives you sort of like a um, a bad eyes view to see some of the different ways that mental health can be impacted when we talk about climate change. Next slide. And so climate change in men, uh, climate change and mental health in Africa. So let's bring it a bit home. We've talked about displacement. We've talked about loss of income. We've talked about livelihood. There's almost a direct line to say, the more we have development issues that are impacted by climate change, then you should expect to see mental health stressors arising um, across different population groups. People with pre-existing mental health challenges are further exposed you know, as a result of this climate change impact. And of course, you know that mental health is not something that is very mainstream in Africa. There's still a lot of stigma and taboo. So you can imagine the multiplier impact that climate change would bring to you know, this population group. Research is also showing us that extreme heat exposure um, happening in different parts of the world, including Africa, is worsening you know, uh, mental health um, outcomes of people. So for example, heat waves are causing increase in substance abuse, causing extreme violence and aggression. And this is actually happening in Africa. We're also seeing that you know, climate, climate impact and disasters can also limit people's access to resources, right? So you can imagine an area that has just been destroyed by a landslide, 
if you have doctors, if you had first aiders, mental health counselors there, they won't even be able to get to work. So it's like there's a multiply effect happening directly and indirectly. We're also seeing that mental health conversation is only gradually becoming accepted. Nigeria, for example, has only just signed the mental health bill. So we see that gradually we need to you know, integrate this conversation so we have something holistic. And as I said earlier, there are still significant gaps in research on climate change and, male, and mental health, not just in the global south, but in Africa. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. Next slide. Hi, Jennifer. This is your five minute notification. Okay, thank you. So other drivers have spoken about this crop failure, losses, you know, fear and um, anxiety of the future and loss of connection. So when people's lands are taken from them as a result of land grabbing and related issues. Next slide. Okay, so I want us to do a very brief activity within this five minutes. If you you've ever encountered any climate emotion. So if you see this wheel, it talks about outrage, frustration, betrayal, disappointment. It would be good to see them if you can put them on the chat. Powerlessness is something that young people have you know, experienced a lot. Adora says worry, grief. People talk about grief, just seeing loss that they cannot you know, be able to quantify. It would be good to read more of that. Um, I think for us, we often ex um, oscillate between the positive and the negative. Some days we're hopeful. Some days we feel extremely overwhelmed. Thank you for that. Overwhelm is one that actually comes a lot when you look at the magnitude of climate change. For us at Susty Vibes, we've also been doing a lot of work around this, looking at eco-anxiety in Africa. And it's interesting to see that, you know, 91% of the people we've surveyed so far actually believe that climate change is real. They've confirmed that eco-anxiety is something that they experience. And they talk about their triggers when they see no action from government, when they think about their future, and when they just see the sheer ignorance across the public. Thank you for that. I see frustration. I see disappointment. Those are all valid. And those are very Africa-centric um, emotions, which we're also experiencing. Thank you very much. Samson says all of them. Thank you. Next slide. And so in summary, climate change is not just impacting our physical health. Our mental health is impacted in diverse ways. Africa is a youthful population, so we must prioritize efforts towards mental health support. Climate adaptation in Africa will greatly benefit from psychological climate resilience. And while there are emerging efforts towards climate change and mental health research, action and more funding is required. Next slide. Um, thank you very much. Um, over to you, Aya. Thank you so much um, for your insightful um, session, Jennifer. It's always a pleasure listening to you, you know, talking about these intersections um, between climate change and mental health. Uh, next slide, please, Dequa. Yeah, so we are grateful for you, Prof. Kenneth and Jennifer, for taking this session. It has been very insightful. Some key takeaways for me, for me right now is, you know, climate change is real. Climate change is real in Africa. It is not just a Western concept. Africans are feeling it. Although, like, we don't have a lot of research around this area, which um, organization like HAS are currently, you know, ongoing around that area, it is real and people are feeling it. You people in normal communities is not just for some special people or anything, and it's really impacting us. Another key takeaway for me is, um, as health professionals, we should understand, you know, the interplay between um, climate change, the environment, and um, health issues, not just even mental health issues in this case, physical health issues like Prof. Um, highlighted during his session, and also mental health issues, you know, even we ho I have personal experience of, you know, the environment impacting me, and I'm sure some people on this, like people have dropped in the chat during Jennifer's session, are also experiencing this. So, so it's a key takeaway for us to understand um, that these are what is um, this is what's currently happening and health workers, you know, this is um, something that we should take into consideration when working with patients. I uh, would like to go into uh, a brief question as 
I would like to have, we have a question for Prof. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I can see Prof is unmuted. So Prof, the question says, considering this intersection between mental health, can you share any insights on the approach to engaging government um, in the in the different countries in Africa to pay attention to this critical area? Sorry, uh, I'm not sure I got it. The, the line was breaking off. Can you take it again? Okay. Uh, yeah, so the question says, um, considering the intersections between climate change and mental health, can you share insights on the approach for engaging governments, you know, across different ministries in different countries in Africa to pay attention to this issue? Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, um, we are talking here, uh, possibly I reckon like experts or student experts in this field. Um, we need to engage stakeholders, policy stakeholders into such workshops like this. That's number one. Uh, we need also to strengthen the capacity of uh, stakeholders in the ministries, uh, Ministry of Environment. If we are having a workshop like this and we have um, key stakeholders from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Environment, uh, Nature Protection, Ministry of Women's Affairs, or Women Development, uh, Ministry of Disaster Management, uh, and all that. These are the kinds of stakeholders that we need to strengthen their capacity, and then we need them to be able to understand this interconnectivity of climate change impact and mental health. At the moment, um, they have a surface understanding of it. They do, they do not really have a deep understanding of it. We have to begin from that level. That's number one. And then number two, we here present, we here present and the youth, we need to uh, start arranging and putting policy brief papers. We have to prepare in order to meet them. These are people, these kinds of stakeholders who would really take policy at a different level are busy with so many of what supposedly would be their priorities. Their priorities may not even be what we're talking about today. Um, and of course, you will realize that um, there is so much development and tourism around climate change issues when they go to summit. You know, they are going for sightseeing and tourism. Uh, really, the business of the day is really what we're doing today here now. We need to discuss this. We need to crystallize these kinds of information that we're doing right now at the moment, and then have it in such a way that we can build workshops for these kinds of stakeholders and stakeholder engagement so that they can move forward. Last but not the least, we need traditional communities. I'm sure you and I are talking now I don't know who here is in a village setting right now. I don't know. I'm sure I'm in a city right now talking. I'm sure, uh, you know, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, we'll probably be in Lagos or some big city talking. How do we really 70% or 80% of Africans, they live in the rural areas, for instance. How do we get them uh, to understand this and start to implement it? That is the question. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your answer, Prof. I hope that has answered your question to the person you asked. Um, I want to ask you one question before going to Jennifer. Um, thank you all for dropping your questions in the chat. We try to reach as many as we can. Um, the next question here says, um, thank you, Prof. Can you share some basic coping mechanisms to help in, um, combat the effects of climate change or mental health? Thank you again. The coping me mechanisms are multifaceted to be able to, to do that. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, for flood communities, uh, take for instance, we have flood communities in Bielsa. Uh, it's coping strategy that we have now. Is it by providing a bag of rice and some crayfish and all that, that will really solve the problem? That's what we've been seeing on, on television. No. See, this is, this is important. Uh, when they provide those... Uh, bags of rice and uh, food items and it's all captured on national tv as philanthropism and all that stuff uh, what long-lasting measures are we putting in place 
And even by that, because of the lack of gut understanding of that intersection of the mental health of those people, there was no mental health framework to deal with them. There was no psychosocial support to deal with those people. So we need to be able to have these kinds of psychosocial support. That's number one. Is that framework available? It is not clearly available at the moment. We need to put, in, put on that particular framework. Number two, when I was presenting my work uh, just a couple of minutes ago, I did mention that uh, we need a holistic support structure. For example, these communities that are all there, we need to look at the environmental challenges that are there in those communities. How do we improve their farming system? And like I mentioned to you, we have green manure. We need to train people on green manure. And I think Sosti Vibes, we can begin to train people on green manure. We have the technology of training people using plants to provoke, uh, you know, increase uh, fertility. That alone is also cushioning their mental effect when they know that the fertilizer, they don't need to buy. They can produce fertilizer themselves and for their crops. Then they're happy. Knowing that once the flood recedes, they go back to their land. They can begin to re-improve their land, not using pesticides, chemical pesticides, not using chemical biocides or chemical, uh, 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 you know, uh, insecticides and pesticides, but they're using biocides, which we have the technology. I can train that. I have, right now as I speak, uh, I have a farm. I'm producing 1,000 birds at the moment, and I'm using mushroom to feed my birds. And I'm using the droppings of the birds to produce fertilizer. And I'm using that to provoke, you know, microalgae in fish ponds. I can send you pictures. I'm doing that. How many of my university colleagues are doing that? And at the same time, I produce, you know, uh, a moringa base and uh, uh, garlic based pesticides to be able to take away aphids from cabbage. Now, my, my mom is doing that. My mom has lives in a flood area. Once the flood recedes, she's doing that. Her mental health is fine because she's able to have control over certain environmental factors. We need to do that. We don't need to talk. When they go to Kenya, when they go to all these COP27, talk, 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 talk. talk. We need Afrocentric technologies. I mean, all them are cultivating mushroom and producing, you know, mushroom-based uh, ectomycorrhiza fungi to put on the crops. We are doing that. If you want to visit my farm, I can show you. How many of them are being able? These farm communities, these flood producing communities, they have outbreaks of cholera and waterborne diseases. We have evidence of that. Now, how do you treat water? By buying um, ever water to come and distribute to them. Then how many, how many bags of ever water or bottles of ever water are you going to give to them? How, when you get back to Abuja or you get back to uh, Kigali or to Yaoundé, how would they sustain themselves? We have a technology using Moringa to treat water so they can sit at their home, abuse the water when they want to. They can even take the flood waters, recover it, and drink. Is that, a, is that interesting? So there's an opportunity in the flood. So we have Moringa-based technology. We can train ourselves, train our youth, train communities, to purify water, uh, to avert waterborne diseases using Moringa technology, which we have. We have been able to confirm it. We have the pilot, which is running for 250 people in a particular village. That's the first ecological water treatment system. How many companies are treating water, their wastewater using this technology? Once you do all this empowerment with this green technology, green technology, you are also cushioning the mental health effect of this particular community because when the worst get to the worst, they know that they have something to that they can fall back on. And once they fall back on that, what happens? That depression goes down, that sadness goes down, that despair goes down, and all that. That's the way we need to follow. Not talk shops. What I see around the world is talk shops. Where is the technology? I leave it back. If I'm asked to challenge Thank society, you. I'll challenge what I'm doing already. Thank you. For that insightful um, as if we had some other questions we have in the chat. Unfortunately, we are unable to take all the case study um session, but we have um people in the chat who are actively answering questions um and will also send your questions to speakers and we can also share that with you after this session. So um, right now, I would like to invite so, so, um, our sorry, case study presenter. Sorry, Miss, uh, Madam Chair. Just, okay. Um, um, because of the fact that I'm probably older than all of you here, if not, <laughs> if not so, I'm not more intelligent than any of you, but more older. I would like to suggest these kinds of training for Sosti Vibe. I'd like to avail my skill for Sosti Vibe to train you Youths on how to purify water using green technology to train youths, uh, especially in flood areas, especially in flood or climate prone areas right now. I'd like to use the umbrella of Sosti Vibe, train them on how to produce clean water 
explain them how to produce fertilizer. I can produce, we can talk about producing fertilizer just from this computer. I can do that training for you people and I invite others. Mm. Thank you very much. So you can continue. I'm sorry for this, uh, for interrupting, but I think it's very important. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Approach to climate change. Uh, um, you know, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, yes, some questions yes, have I been answered in the chat box too. So we can, we can check them yeah. out. Yeah, I mentioned that already. So you can also go through the chat and see if your question has been answered. Um, so uh, and thank you so much, Prof, for on that very important skill. We'll definitely be reaching out to you. We have a lot of young people who are interested in this in our community, and they'll be happy to be a part of that session. Uh, so we would like to invite Mr. Bethwell, who is also a mental health professional, to share his case study on mental climate change and mental health intersections, you know, highlighting Somalia, which he has worked in. Mr. Bethwell, you own the floor. You can unmute now, Mr. Bethel. Okay, okay, thank you so much. I really want to thank uh, Kennedy and Jennifer for the wonderful presentation they have made. And I wish I knew you earlier because uh, I've been lacking people to work with who have such an enormous information like you. <clears throat> uh, as I've been introduced, I'm Bethel and I've been working for the last 28 years, mainly on mental health. And uh, I've responded to quite a number of uh, uh, issues related to mental health, but uh, mostly in disaster areas. And uh, uh, it, it has been nice working in many, many of these, it, it, both in Africa and outside Africa. Uh, we're going to talk about a case study in Somalia as a country. The picture that you are seeing is an, a, an outmat of uh, something that happened by- Mr. Bacho, yes. sorry, your video is off. We can't see you. Oh, you want to see me? Yes, sir. You can see me? Okay, yes, we can. Uh, yeah, I was saying, there are many pictures that I can show of Somalia, but I have actually picked a few on this. Somalia has been having civil war for the last more than 30 years. There are children who are born and they have never known peace. Um, Somalia itself has been segmented. They, have got, they don't have stable government, as I can say, although they are trying to have it now. But we have Somaliland, we have Puntiland, and we have the the main Somalia, Somalia as a country. So they have won so much, drew so much, and uh, uh, they are, most of the population or most of the people in Somalia have had the actual effects of climate change. We have got so many who have migrated to countries like Kenya. They have IDBs within the country, and it, this one is basically from what Jennifer and Canada say, floods, uh, um, lack of food, and many other related issues. So as I'm saying, these fires that you are seeing, destroyed so many of the homes of the Somalia people. So it, after losing a home, some even died. It caused a lot of anxiety to their members. It caused a depression. It caused a lot that they could not even do anything for themselves. So as we are going to see, it is a scenario that can give you a picture of climate change and mental health. So there are so many vulnerabilities as we're going to mention them. Next slide. Give me the next slide, please. Uh, so the case study is going to be focused, we're going to be focusing on Somalia and Somalia is within the Horn of Africa. 
this Somali, as I said, has been affected in a very big way through uh, violent extremists, various climate change related challenges, including trial, fraud, and shifting weather patterns. And the case study I'm about to present uh, is going to tell us, oh, it, the, it's aimed at assessing the relations between climate change, mental health, and other socioeconomic stresses in Somalia. As well, uh, it will identify the vulnerable groups, their coping mechanisms, the police gaps, and the resilience building structures. Like if this were to be done, then we'll be able to address the issues that affect Somalia. I might not go into a specific case, but I'll give scenarios and scenarios of the mental health issues that has affected the community and how they have been addressed. Next. So this, the by chart indicates a summary of what happens in Somalia. If you could, if you can remember what Kennedy presented, it's almost the same, that we have epidemics, we have heart earthquakes, we have drought and uh, storm, which causes flood. And uh, also there is a uh, miscellaneous accidents. These miscellaneous accidents, though they are miscellaneous, it affects the mental status of the, of the population or the people of Somalia. We have many, many issues that come out of this. Like if all this happened or if one of this happened, then the Somalia people or the people who live in Somalia normally get issues. Like as I said, when we have, during the war that people migrated so many of them. In fact, we lack experts. We don't have psychologists, that's then. We don't have psychiatrists. We didn't have mental health, it can be psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, they were not there. So even if people could have such challenges, then the support was minimal or is minimal as to date. They depend on what NGOs like UN can provide. So it's a huge, huge area that needs support. And all of us coming together, we can have a way forward. But this case scenario will give you an overview of exactly what's happening. Next. Mr. Patel, this is um, a prompt for five minutes left for your session. Mine? <laughs> okay. So. They, 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 uh, as I can summarize is that uh, there are many, many issues in Somalia and the cases that we identified, most of them, or let me narrow to a case whereby after the, 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 the migration of Somalis from Somalia to Kenya, people were carrying or coming out with children. And as they walk, they don't have food, they don't have water. Many lost their children on the way to Kenya. When they reach the refugee camp, some of those who appeared to be mentally unstable, they were chained. And we could find some who had been in chain for as long as 15 years. So imagine removing the chain, giving this person to eat or nutritional status should be because we were compromised and then the mental status assessed and put on treatment. Next. So we had to train some people or people have to be trained so that they are able to address the issues that are at hand. Next. Yeah, so after doing this, some groups or some people in Somalia got their issues at rest. And uh, if it was a displacement, we, they have to be put in ITPs. And then psychologists, psych psychologists, counselors, psychiatrists could do an evaluation and see how much they can be supported. Next. 
So the vulnerable groups, this way I could want to talk a bit. Women, they had, they had their own vulnerabilities. And in Somalia, most women are not given that is befits them. In most cases, men make decisions. Children uh, are just left. They don't attend school. They, they, they see the violence that happens and even join the groups, the extremist groups. Um, young people, employment is not there, poor educational systems, in, and uh, there's gender inequality for when you compare boys and girls. And uh, men also, they had their own issues, like the conflict itself gave them a lot of issues, economic and social challenges, harmful coping mechanisms and lack of mental health services, which I think up to now is not sufficient. Next. Next. Oh, Kennedy had talked about this, Professor Kennedy, about coping mechanisms. So the, the Islamic as a religion, actually they do a lot of support in terms of coping mechanisms. So the psycho-spiritual approaches, seeking social support. Uh, avoidance is good, although harmful at times. And unfortunately, up to date, there is chaining, although we try to do unchaining program, whereby we unchain them. Anybody who appeared to look and uh, not find, always they are chained. Next. So, if we are to build resilience, that we must include the community, the no past policies, youth empowerment program, and research interventions. This one really is aligned to what Canada said. Next, um, these gaps. I think I'll just summarize us that um, we lack most things, especially understanding of what mental illness are what in kind of interventions there is there, there, there's no direct connect connectiveness mental health with other health givers and also there's inadequate mental health services and professionals are to date a lot of stigma and discrimination because once you've been identified mentally and well you have to be isolated then even the in the clan and the we need to have these uh, gender specific policies whereby access or education and the youth empowerment can really work out if it is taken in seriously. Another, next. So I, this is sort of a repetition because the limitation and challenges, number one, as the others have said, data limitations due to unreliable limited data on mental health. I'm talking about Somalia. Limited generalization of findings to other regions. And then I have a reliance on test review. This one, uh, Kennedy talked about it. Next. Um, so additionally, ongoing conflict security concern in access to certain areas up to date. Attributing to specific mental health impacts solely the climate change complex, given that contributing factors, resources, constraints may limit the study scale and policy implementations. And the Somalia's political instability and humanitarian challenges can affect the policy effectiveness to date. So the dynamic nature of climate change and the, and the interconnectedness of factors contributing to mental health challenges further complicate the study scope. So as much as uh, the study was being carried, there are so many issues that in the effective case study scenarios. And in future, if we are to work together, we need to go there, meet the community, meet the government, meet the families, meet the clients, so that they understand the connectors between climate change and the mental health issues that is happening now. Next. So I do recommend that the study, I mean, we, the study governments community based mental health support, youth empowerment programs, gender inclusiveness approaches, research initiatives, 
accurately gauge the prevalence of climate change linked to mental health disorders in Somalia. So the case study emphasized on the urgent need for policies, prioritizing mental health services, strengthening community resources, and integrating mental health into climate change adaptations. Actually, like we had um, governments, uh, African governments, come, uh, they were integrated in Kenya and they were talking about climate change. I listened to them very well, but the issue of mental health was not even mentioned. So we have a huge work to do ahead of us if when it comes to and uh, addressing such issues now and in future. Next. Yes, so in summary, Somalia, I can say it's more of a fertile land. It's not, has not been touched. The people who are called mental health experts, most of them are working here in Kenya or other developed uh, and, and in the developed countries. They lack human resource. They lack uh, information. And they lack even basic drugs when you are addressing this mental health patients. And it is almost 100% the reason why we have these mental health patients, it is due to climate change because Somalia, as if you can read about it, or if you can get more information about it, the climate is changing from worse to worst. And it, they need an urgent support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Betwell, for um, for your presentation. It just highlighted, you know, what both speakers have said and given practical example of you know, this happening in real time. I would like to invite participants to share their comments, you know, on this presentation and what what do you think about you know the interventions and the methodology. Uh, and also just give it to our speakers for two minutes because we are way above time. Jennifer, if you can just give you know a wrap up of what you think about this session in two minutes. Thank you, Ayo. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Betwell. I think two things jumped out to me. The fact that we have migration on one hand happening and then a lack of resources, not just research, but actual mental health professionals who are able to you know, assist and support um, with what's happening on the ground. So how do we find out, for example, what are the climate change impacts happening in Somalia? And how would you know, this climate change impacts now um, worsen mental health outcomes? I mean, looking at people in chains having to migrate and then not having indigenous and local experts in the country just shows me that you know it's a mental health disaster in itself. So I thought it was really interesting and something that really, really needs to get into the hands of policymakers, particularly in the African Union, people who are looking at the continent in a holistic area to see how do we support from um, a continent um, point of view. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, now we'll go into our post quiz session. Um, I can see um, people already answering the questions. So the post quiz is just, you know, a repetition of the pre-quiz that we had earlier, but this is just, you know, trying to measure the knowledge gained. Um, if you didn't take the pre-quiz, it's also fine for you to take the post quiz. We just want to, um, you know, measure the knowledge gained across participants pre, pre the session and um, post session. So, uh, yeah, I can see we're already beginning to get responses. If you have any issues, if the um, poll is not showing on your screen, kindly you leave that in the chat and our tech technical person will reach out to you. Like I said earlier, there are no penalties for the questions. This is just you know, a learning call for us to know what, we, what we've learned in today's session. And as a way to go back and reflect on our learning this session, this session will also be posted. Um, the link to the, to the recording will also be shared by you, um, by us to you. So rest assured, you can always still come back and you know, visit the session and learn more. But this is just for us to get you know, 
a, a flash survey of what you think about what we've been learning for these past minutes. I'll encourage you to share more, please. We'll definitely share our answers after this session. If you can't see the poll, please drop that in the comments so our technical person can reach out to you. Thank you for the people who have answered. Um, we are still expecting those of you still on the call to kindly take the poll. It's fun just to you know see what have I learned today, um, and you know how can I do better as an individual. This is um, you know a really insightful session, even for me. Although I work in this space, it's always nice to you know go over the basics over and over to learn the importance of. Um, and the need for professionals, mental health professionals and other professionals, medical professionals, you know, to understand why climate change is an important um, crisis in, in our current times. So we know those who are truly following with us. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Mr. Betwell. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Elizabeth, um, would we'll move to end the poll now so we can share answers. Okay. All right. Um, I would read out the um answers. So for the que first question, where we have climate change is a dash issue. 
and we have health, human rights, justice, A and B only, and everything. Climate change, you know, like our speakers have said earlier, is an health issue, is a human rights issue, is a justice issue. So all of the above, if you are speaking all of the above, you're right. Um, and the second question says, the following are prevalent climate havocs in sub-Saharan Africa, except our options, they had flood, had wildfires, had extreme drought, mudslides, and landslides. Funny, nobody picked landslides, but one thing that we don't fully experience in Africa is wildfires. Um, flood literally leads to mudslides and landslides when the soil is too weak to carry the weights kept on it. So everything just washes down, basically. Wildfires um, have been reported in some places in Africa, but it's not as widespread as it currently is in, in, um, in the global north. The next question says, do you agree that climate change can impact the mental health of Africa, of Africans? Um, and that is a resounding yes. Um, another question says, the following are mental effects due to climate change. Yeah, we have anxiety, bipolar, migration, grief, and malaria. And um, malaria is not, you know, a direct, um, um, impact of climate change. So malaria is the um, right answer in this case. And yeah, um, our fifth question says, eco-anxiety means, and the answer is, eco-anxiety is getting worried and restless due to environmental related emotions. And we can see that majority of our participants also the goal got this question right. Um, the sixth question says, eco-emotions and eco-anxiety means the same thing. Uh, and the answer is false. No, they don't mean the same thing. And the last question says, one of the following can result in aggressive behavior in victims. It says rainfall, sandstorm, heat waves, and air pollution. And the correct answer for that is heat waves. Heat waves have been studied to increase aggressive behavior in citizens. So thank you all for taking part in this poll. Um, I hope we will learn um, a lot and the difference um, is clear from our pre um, quiz and now our post quiz. Next, we'll go into sharing a reaction poll. Would like to know, you know, what you what you thought about the session so far, and you know what other things you like to see us improve on, uh, other things that you also like for us to include in the session. Can we have the reaction poll, please? So now we have the reaction survey on your screen and it's just a total of six questions. We just want to know how, you know, has this session been helpful to you? Is it related, related to your um, current work? Do you like um, our interactivity in this session? Would you want to see more, um, you know, your knowledge pre and post session? We'd just like to, you know, get that from you so we can improve on um, delivering these sessions to you. Like I said earlier, this um, training is participants focused. We really want to train um, according to what mental health professionals feel, what they want to see and what they want to learn about. This training is for you. So that is why we are having this reaction survey to know what you think. Um, we'll just leave it for one minute for you all to join. So if you've also done the survey, you can drop down in the comment section. The survey is still ongoing. Can we see the survey now? I saw in the comments someone said they can see. Please see if you can see, just notify us in the comment section, but it's currently ongoing. We just like to get this reaction. We are so happy with everybody who has joined us from all over Africa. And this session will continue for six months, you know, and our topics are geared towards, you know, mental health professionals who are on this call and in Africa. Basically.
Yeah, thank you, Excel. Thank you, Joan. Thank you all for dropping in your answers. We truly appreciate you, know, you giving us feedback so we can serve you better. Thank you all. You can just drop down in the comment section if you feel the survey to receive special appreciation and special shout outs. Please, let's fill the poll. We want to have your feedback. We can type done in the chat box so that we'll be able to know that you've done it or you were able to get it done. Please, I want to see more done. Yeah, I've only seen four in the chat box, five. I guess we should start counting. Yeah, we have two minutes to go, so... I guess I'll just start counting like we used to do when we were younger. <laughs> so I, I will be counting for us. Let's let's type more. <laughs> let's type done. Let's type done. We want so to are have we going from feedback. 60 downwards? <laughs> 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 yeah. Samson, thank you. Thank you, Uche. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Akuna. Thank you. Um, I'll pass over to Okwe now to just take the wrap up. Thank you all for you know joining our session today and participating in all our polls. <laughs> this has been really helpful for us. Okwe, over to you. All right, while I'm still talking, please, we can still be taking the poll. So let's also still be filling the poll. And so we are so grateful to have everybody join us here today. We are so happy to have you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your participation, your engagement, and your contribution to this learning session. And like we said earlier, this is going to be like um this is going this is a um learning series, right? And this is the first out of the six learning sessions. So we have another one coming up next month in October and. At that learning session, like we said again about Anchor, it's going to be led by our specialists, like our African experts in this field. And next session in October, we are going to be exploring how we can raise awareness on the impacts of mental um, climate change on our mental health. And I think this is something every one of us here would like to be part of. And we want to see you all again in our next session. And also, please stay connected with us on our social media platform so that, you know, you can easily as well get notification of our upcoming updates on discussions and conversations bordering around climate change and mental health, because we are always dishing out content that are very good and great regarding this. So um, slide, please. Let's go to the next slide, please. So that we can see, we can see the social media platform to follow us on our social media handles so that you can stay connected. Uh, please, let's go to the slide with, yes. Let's go, this is our social media handle. We can see for Instagram, Twitter. We can see also for LinkedIn. And also, if you want to reach out to Ross, you have anything you want to share with us, our email address also is there. So please do not, 
do not forget to post about this learning session today on your social media. Tag us on our respective social media handles who would like to read about your learning experience and also stay connected with us because there are many more interesting and impactful programs like this upcoming. Thank you so much for joining us today. We sincerely appreciate you. See you in class next time. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. See you in next class. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so, so much. We appreciate you.